Hi, you guys, and welcome to a special edition of Quantum Conversations. And I'm excited to be sharing with you one of my favorite guests that uh, we've had a couple times on the Quantum Alignment Show, who is returning to talk to us today about quantum activism. So our guest today is quantum physicist, Dr. Amiko Slami, who is a retired full professor from the University of Oregon's Department of Physics. He's a pioneer in what he calls the quantum worldview. His insights and teachings are available in the form of several books and documentaries, including the Everything Answer book, which is what we talked about the last time we were here, and Quantum Economics, which is actually one of my very favorite books. And uh, he is his teachings are in line with the world's wisdom traditions, especially from Indian Vedanta, yoga, and the Buddhism tradition. He beautifully and artfully and in a scientific way marries spirituality with science. And the teachings that he shares extends back and marries 5,000 years worth of ancient wisdom with really basically about 100 years of modern quantum physics principles. These teachings actually serve as the backbone for a movement that he is, has inspired and is working to serve and has been serving over the last 10 years called quantum activism. And he is using the, this movement and the energy of everything that he's created to build a university designed to help people move beyond creating just for their own personal gain and to begin a process of building a world built on the foundation of the energy of well-being. Welcome, Dr. Goswami. It's just always an honor to have you here. I'm excited Thank for you, what Swami. we're going to talk about. Thank you. Good to be with you. <laughs> so I want to I want to kind of go back to basics a little bit today, and then move forward a little bit. And the first thing that I really want to explore is, I, I would love for you to talk to us about. What's the difference between what you call Newtonian consciousness or the Newtonian worldview versus the quantum worldview? Fundamental, fundamental differences. The <laughs> Newtonian worldview really uh, is not able to deal with consciousness. It's a machine worldview. And unless you are a believer that machines have consciousness somehow and somehow we are machines and our consciousness is also machine consciousness. The machine approach, Newtonian approach is totally hopeless, really. I mean, it cannot even deal with the subject of the self. Now, we all know that we have an I agreed that we make it into an object called me and pamper that object agreed, but still nobody can deny that whenever we have an experience, there are two poles of it. One is the object pole, but the other is the subject. I experience that momentary experience, the present centered experience of the I, that is fundamental to human being. And this the Newtonian approach cannot treat. And therefore, you know, it has to be considered useless as far as the human aspects of human being is concerned. So what I do is to uh, take quantum physics, which fortunately nobody anticipated this, um, <laughs> but you know, because it's physics and we are taught that physics is the uh, science of matter and energy. Nobody expected physics to reveal the nature of consciousness, but it does. Very strange way, quantum physics declared that Newtonian objects that Newton thought belong to space and time and are determined in their movements and all, are not like that at all. They are waves instead. But of course, they cannot be waves in the domain where we live because there we know that there are particles. Newtonian physics does agree with experimental data. So where are these waves? Where do they exist? Where do they reside? And um, upon some work um, to which Einstein himself contributed, it was found that this is the world where everything is interconnected instantly. Um, any two objects in that world have the potential ability by simply interacting, becoming one, so that they can communicate instantly without exchanging signals. 
and this is the the other world where the waves reside and this is the one that Alan Aspey has experimentally demonstrated that it does exist. The signalless communication does exist between quantum objects. And therefore, there is no doubt about this unity world, world where everything is one, because everything is potentially able to communicate with itself instantly without exchanging a signal, which indicates separateness. So these subjects don't have any separateness in, this, in that domain, potentially. Of course, it has to be manifested by interacting, agreed. And then what I have shown in my work is that because without an observer, the objects do not transform their waveness into the particleness of the space-time world. Therefore, I have argued that the that this world, this unity world, is nothing but the unity consciousness that spiritual traditions talk about. That was my great contribution to the world of knowledge and wisdom. And of course, I'm very happy for it because it integrates science and spirituality mm -hmm. finally. I mean, what a relief. These two great institutions of human civilization have remained unattached to each other for 400 years. Enough is enough. And now we have found quantum physics and a way to unite, integrate these two great institutions of wisdom. Beautiful, beautiful. So one of the things that I've heard you talk about in different ways is the power and the importance of perspective and how perspective influences what influences the quantum potentials that we end up collapsing or manifesting into our reality. And when we think about perspective and we think about as human beings, we all have perspectives and those perspectives come from genetics, from conditioning. What else in the human condition makes it so difficult for us to really embrace and align with a quantum worldview, especially, I mean, if you look at the news, which I don't think anybody should right now, but especially when you look at, you know, what's going on on the planet right now, why, is it so difficult for humans to embrace, first of all, the idea that there's unity consciousness, and secondly, the idea that maybe the way in which we create isn't just related to the physical work that we do, but also the non-local work that we do? You know, what will surprise you, and what does surprise me every time I see it happening, is that even the divided world is very divided United States of America, which used to be an ideal for displaying the kind of unity of one country, one spirit. And this world is now so divided. Uh, this is where you and I live. So, no, but even when we analyze this, you know, and we see quantum non-locality. I'll, I'll explain. Okay. When we are in the rational mode, when we talk like, rational thinking, it becomes logical, like computers, algorithmic, and then no non-locality. Non-locality is the name of the signalless unity connection. So that signalless unity connection cannot occur when you are in the rational mode of expressing and thinking. But our political leaders know that when people are emoting, then they can be one segment. So what happens with some of the political leaders today that they institute fear in their subjects. And fear is a unifier in a funny kind of way. It mm -hmm. unifies people which we call tribal consciousness. But it's not a pejorative thing. Actually, it is the non-local quantum effect that is taking place, except unfortunately, the leaders, they are naughty leaders, they are evil people. Sorry to use this, uh, evil has other connotation. I really don't want to, I mean, I, I, I know they want to win and winning is everything today and therefore they behave like that. They may not be evil, evil, but they, they use this quantum non-locality of our emotional mode to excite people. And this is why we are seeing so much division today. I mean, really, I have lived here for 50 years of my life. 
I have never found uh, people to be this much divisive. Okay, sure, people don't agree with each other. There is a little bit of racism here, sexism there, and all that. But it was never uh, enough to, uh, for people not to be polite with each other. This fundamental um, agreement of being an American means that you see somebody on the street and you smile, you don't frown, you don't mm-hmm. say pejorative things to them. That, uh, that is now gone. And that is gone on the basis of this fear that political leaders are using more and more increasingly from both sides. It's not just Donald Trump, but uh, Democrats do the same thing from the opposite side. And this is breaking apart the country. <clears throat> so so I, I want to extrapolate a little bit out of this, because I think what you're saying is so vital. And, and what I'm hearing you say is that the way in which we create is mechanical, that we can look at what we create in our world, especially when we are creating with a high, a high intensity of an emotional reaction, that that emotional reaction influences the creative state and that when we are strictly coming from our minds, we're not nearly as creative as when we're coming from that offering of emotional energy. Is, is that, am I getting that right so far? You are getting in the right place. So that when that emotional energy is fear-based, then we resort to our conditioning. When that same emotional energy is based on love, then we get into creativity. I mean, it's, it's so simple. I mean, love is simply letting go of this fear that separates us. And, 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 and is love so, so very difficult for, for us, for, for Americans, for human beings? It's built into us in the form of romantic love in the heart chakra. Every one of us, when we are in our teenage experience, it. so when we experience it from our mothers, uh, even when we are babies, So we know about love. I mean, human beings cannot say that, look, I didn't know. (laughs) No, we know about love very, very well. (laughs) We we get into fear because it's easily accessible. The tribal mindset is much more easy to enact with fear than with love. Yes, love requires a little bit more effort because the, the romantic juices or the motherly bond are with special people. To bring that out for everybody requires a little bit of effort. But, you know, I have written so many books on it. I mean, people should have hardly any doubt that love is easily something that we can cultivate within us. (laughs) So, perfect. So then the next thing that makes sense to me, based on what you've just said, is that if you are looking out on the world right now and you're saying, you know, this isn't what I like. I don't want this then because it's just mechanical to change the nature of reality, then we individually can then begin to choose to cultivate a different quality of emotional energy, love. And in response to cultivating that energy of love, that through that experience of love, we can begin to create something better, something different. Yes? Exactly. So this is what, you know, I'm writing a book on quantum politics, I'll share with you. This is my message, it's very simple. I mean, it is really very simple. We have to change from the dynamics of fear to dynamics of love. But we cannot do it on the basis of scientific materialism, the idea that everything is Newtonian, everything is material, everything is determined. Love cannot be included in Newtonian science. So before Democrats or any political party tries to bring love, it must not be empty. This is why I talk about quantum activism. You have to change yourself first. You have to first agree that I must think in a way that allows love. If I think in the Newtonian way, love is not allowed. Consciousness is not allowed. So it does not help to talk about love when your thinking is empty of it. This is why Hillary could not connect with people. This is why Democrats also today, some do. I mean, I'm glad that women are running in great numbers. So, you know, uh, you don't mind me talking about politics so much because... Uh, Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) You're you're singing to the choir here. So thank you. It's perfect. Good. So, you know, so, so one has to find love for yourself first. And this is why quantum activism, you change yourself. Change your thinking. Change your thinking from Newtonian thinking to quantum thinking. 
then consciousness is allowed, then love is allowed. And then you cultivate love. When you cultivate love, then can you spread it? Yes, you can, but not being an intellectual. You know, the, the intellectuals do not have the access to love. I was one myself, I know. I had to change before I could talk about love and experience love and people could recognize that, yes, this is a loving being, so I can hear him talk about love and respect. That moral authority does not come until you yourself have the capacity of loving. Fortunately for us, 50% of our people are women and they have a natural access to love. And this is what's holding up the humankind. Otherwise, human society would long ago just kill each other off. I'm sure of it. <clears throat> so can, I just want to restate that because I want to make sure I heard that correctly. And I, 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 and I, uh, I will just say I have eight children. I have five daughters. And I have to put this into language for them because they fight for this every day. What you're saying is that the power of the heart of a woman the love that women naturally have access to is part of what's keeping the world stabilized at this moment. Is that what you just said? Yes, that's what I just said. And the biggest problem today, but I have to share the, you know, my daughter just told me this morning and I agree with, you know, with her because I have seen that too, um, which is that the current crop of women are being actively taught that it is best for going ahead in society to be more like a man mm -hmm. and give up on love this traditional sacred spiritual way and settle for casual sex. And mm, she is concerned as I am that this trend uh, is even more disastrous than the dumbing down of people, men and women under IT that has happened. Information technology in general, as you know, has led to a dumbing down of people. People cannot process meaning anymore. People um, are into information so much that uh, literally their brain have lost the capacity of processing meaningful things for themselves. Of course, there is also uh, Occupy Wall Street movement and there are, I know, the you know, student followers of Barry Sanders who are into meaning. So fortunately, there is a large fraction of young people who are not into giving up on love, giving up on meaning. They are rediscovering love and meaning. And these are the people who I would like to see in leadership position. But we should be very much aware, and this is why I'm establishing the university, that look, you have to learn about these things because the opposite can be taught to you very easily. Human beings are conditionable, although they are not machines, but unfortunately, they are very conditionable. The reason is that we have negative emotional brain circuit, and we very quickly see the advantage of going for me-centeredness, what is in it for me. Mm -hmm. And that short-term advantage can very easily fool us. So if somebody shows me a lot of short-term advantage for uh, being in a certain way, give up my dignity and give up the love that I feel for people and pretend to be intellectual and pretend to be heartless and that, that gives us promotions, we can get fooled by it. But it will eventually only lead to failure and disillusionment because as the wisdom goes, money does not buy happiness and love. We have to do more than money, just get money. Um, and this very concept of job has, of course, to change. You know, this is a long history to go into, but why, why do we do things this way? And it's not going to, going to be this way anyway, because computers will take over all the routine jobs that we do for which we are giving up our humanity. But really, if robotics go in the way that people are predicting, then human beings have to come back to their humanness. Otherwise, they will have nothing to do in the world. Good point. Very good point. So I have, I have a question, and, and I think this is a question that is a, just a practical attempt to sort of ground all of this that you're talking about. 
If you are wanting to contribute more than the idea of what's in it for me, if you're somebody who's really seeking to make a contribution from a different place and a contribution that is rooted in the concept that you talk about a lot is well-being, the energy or the archetype of well-being. What's the first place that you recommend that someone starts to make change? Well, the first place really is um, something that we all care about. First place is the mental health and the second place is the physical health. Really what I'm talking about is just so important. If you pay attention to just your mental health and accept the fact that I need to expand my conscious occasionally because that's my entry point to happiness other than the pleasure items. But how much of the pleasure items can you have? How much can you eat? How much sex can you have? How much, uh, you know, you've got to depend on drugs if you really, really want to just feed material pleasures. And drugs are very dangerous because our brain has problems with habit circuits, uh, addiction circuits. So mm -hmm. any educated person should know that, that drugs are not the answer. So what is the answer then? How do we find happiness in our life? How do we find well-being, the sense of well-being? And the answer, of course, is that by expanding our consciousness. And then we discover our consciousness expands most easily with positive emotions, with love, with being fair to somebody, with being good to somebody, with, with, with appreciating beauty in our lives. These are the ways to expand consciousness and these are the ways to find positive emotions and balance those negative emotional brain circuits. The two things that destroy us, that separates us, is one is rationality and the other is this negative emotional brain circuits. These negative emotional brain circuits, they take over. They are not subject to your rational thinking. When they take over, you do atrocious things. Even rational people are known to have done so many atrocious things mm -hmm. in the world. And why? Because the negative emotions are not ruled by rationality. We have to transform before we can change our succumbing to negative emotions. So again, what I'm hearing you say is take care of yourself, engage in higher order archetypes like beauty and self-care and uh, self-renewal, mental health, take care of yourself, and that to make a better contribution to the world, the, you start first by taking care of yourself first. And that that's not selfish. That's actually the most powerful contribution you can make. Is that yes. correct? Because, because you, are, you are really approaching the archetype of wholeness. You don't know it because we, don't, we never express healing as, as establishing wholeness within yourself. But that's what healing is about. Because healing is not, you know, the sense of well-being does not come from the physical body. It comes from what we call vital body in our new science. The vital body is what we feel, the vitality that we feel when we are well. I mm -hmm. mean, anybody who has even a sickness uh, of cold knows the difference, right? When you mm -hmm. have a cold, your vitality is down. You don't feel that sense of well-being. And as soon as the cold is gone, you know, the transition makes it so clear. Oh, I can breathe again. Oh, I can feel vital again. I can feel energy again. I mean, that's such a horrendous difference. And, and, and this is what people's introduction to, to hope, ex, ex, what expansion of consciousness means. Consciousness is contracted. Uh, you had, that's what we call these ease. Look at the etymological origin of the word, these ease, lack of ease. Ease is the relaxation, ease is the expansion of consciousness. So when we have well-being, the opposite, expansion of consciousness. So that's our first inkling that really we have this expansion of consciousness to seek happiness. And then we just simply ask the question, what will expand my consciousness? And we discover, yes, smiling at people expands consciousness. Yes, meditating in a relaxed way expands consciousness. Yes, loving somebody expands consciousness, being fair, getting rid of all this sexism, racism that we talked about, 
being fair is a big part of feeling good about ourselves and that expands consciousness. Giving expands consciousness. Being humble expands consciousness. So many ways to expand consciousness and as we discover them, we cultivate those qualities and that's what gives us positive emotional brain circuits to finally balance the negativity that we are burdened with. Perfect, good. So if somebody wants to become part of your quantum activism movement, how can they find out more about this? Well, we have a website called Quantum Activism, Q-U-A-N-T-U-M-A-C-T-I-V-I-S-M dot O-R-G, quantumactivism.org. That's the website for the university. That will give you all the details. There is also my own website, A-M-I-T-G-O-S-W-A-M-I dot O-R-G, amitgoswami.org. That also has all the information that the quantumactivism.org has. So those are the two main sources. I have uh, Facebook, Twitter, and as well as the quantum activism um, website. So people can access us very, very easily. And, and, and by the way, there was an email on my website and I or my assistant responds to every email that we receive. Perfect, beautiful. So I am so excited to hear what you have to share and I really appreciate the depth of knowledge and the depth of heart that you bring to this, I think, very important movement. And I really want to invite all of you to deeply embrace the idea that your consciousness and the quality of the consciousness that you consciously cultivate is a vital part to changing the world and for you to never downplay how important your role is in changing the world. And thank you for giving us the science behind that important concept, Dr. Goswami. I am looking forward to your politics book, <laughs> and very much so. I think we need it now, <laughs> and uh, really appreciate you being with us today and sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much. And I look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.